Welcome to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey's Seattle Kraken podcast. All right, RJ, I'm going to try something here. We're going to see if it works. Discord doesn't let you hear it, but I think this will be a good way to like start the podcast from here on, okay? Okay. All right, hopefully it picked that up. I think it's a good like bell. It's, it's nautical sounding to me, at least on my end, live in person. Hopefully the mic picked it up for everybody. But it sounds like, you know, them ringing the, the ship bell. It's, it, you know, it's I didn't for... hear a thing, so I will take your word for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, everybody. Welcome back to the deep dive. <laughs> hopefully you heard the bell because um, I think it's it's fun. RJ. We, we had a couple of Kraken games last week, but we're not going to talk about that because we had the All-Star Weekend, specifically yes, we the did. All-Star Skills Competition, because that's really what we were all there for. It seemed like on Twitter that was what everybody was there for as well. Um, and, you know, it was it was it was pretty good. It wasn't the best one that I've seen, but it was pretty good, I thought. Yeah, no, there was some good recovery from some early technical glitches. <laughs> I, I loved within the first five minutes of the broadcast, they had like seven or eight different things going wrong. Yeah. Uh, but overall, yeah, it, it was it was a good skills competition. It, you know, it's it's kind of up there with where it is. Not the best, not the worst. Uh, but yeah, it was fine. My, again, my biggest problem is just why are we listening to like announcer people talk? Why do we have commentators? I want to hear the players. They're sitting exactly. there ta- talking the entire time. Why are we not hearing them? Yeah, we talked about having this, you know, skills competition as part of a way to see the player's personality. And they really do show their personality more. They're talking, they're chirping mm-hmm. each other all the time uh, during the skills competition. And yet we're just hearing these announcers and certainly this time half-heartedly talking. Yes. I mean, you talk about the, the fountain or any of the other events really just like, oh, look at that. Yep. Oh, it's in the net. He got it. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh no, that one's off. Like <laughs> that wow. adds nothing. That that shot was fast in the hardest shot competition. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the radar gun says 100 miles an hour. That's generally considered fast. I don't know the digits. The one commentator I didn't mind was the fountain one. I know that was the one you really didn't like, but I liked him because he was just being sarcastic and kind of mean to the players while they were doing it. Like I thought that was great. <laughs> you know what actually i i didn't i didn't pick up on that completely but now that i look back at it you know what that was I, that did add an element to it i suppose like like he was like as as people would start to struggle after claude Giroux, i think it was who went first did so poorly he was just like or no huberdo huberdo did so <laughs> poorly at first he was just like anytime anybody started to struggle like they missed two trying to get one of the things they'd miss two shots he'd just be like jonathan huberto back here really hoping this continues stuff like that just like right next to the player i was like this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah some some players had a rough go with that you could tell uh the frustration was setting in especially with them having to tap the top of the pucks why could they shooting it? yeah why could they not be pre-lit I, there was no intern sense. around just to kind of smack those things into the ground real quick and set him up for him, like just to have like twenty ready to go. Yeah, that that didn't make any sense to me, and you can tell it was frustrating the players too. Yeah, or make Jonathan Huberto do it after he did so poorly on the first go of it. Yeah, just have him smack <laughs> your punishment. For we, we all know you're finishing last now, bud. You just got to sit here and, and click all the pucks for everybody. Um, so I don't know. I thought that one was the only one where the announcer guy was kind of fun, bringing some personality. Because boy, that also felt like the event with the least personality from the players. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the one line really anyone said, I think it was uh, Eberly actually, mm-hmm. who contributed that. He just said, please just tell me I did better than G. Yeah. Me and Claude Giroux. Like, that's yeah. all I want to hear. Uh, spoiler alert, he didn't. No. But, <laughs> but still, like, you know, he's got his buddy there. He just wants to do better than him. You know, let us hear more of that stuff. Exactly. There's no reason not to. Zach Rowensky sacrificing any semblance of a personality he had to ensure he won certainly wasn't <laughs> beneficial in that one. But man, I like I liked that though, like like the idea of it, and I thought that the event was pretty cool. I was right in my predictions. Defensemen were going to do better. Yes, you certainly right in that. We're right in that element. I know you picked Roman Yossi to win. He got close. Yeah, picked um, the wrong defenseman. Yep, and uh, I picked uh, Jocelyn Lamoureux Davidson. She did pretty well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she she gave it a good go. But uh, yeah, no, Roman Yossi was just uh, you know was dialed in certainly on that first one. Yeah. 
yeah, and then just couldn't couldn't close it out at the end. That's all right. The other new event, the twenty one, I had really high hopes for it. The the twenty one and twenty two thing or whatever. I had really high hopes for it. I didn't realize that they weren't going to be like replacing cards maybe between rounds or that mm-hmm. like like just kind of how the rules were going to be like because that turned into kind of a disaster pretty quick. It did. And it's probably, although for the best, that they didn't replace cards in between rounds, because I don't know that the players ever would have gotten anything but 21. I mean, you had to Mm -hmm. kind of force a winner. All the players got 21. I mean, it shows just how good, how accurate these guys are, that they can essentially just pick their spot. It was very rare for guys to miss. And you you got the feeling that Joe Pavelski was just going to be able to hit whichever card he wanted. Yeah, him and Stamkos. I mean, like, yep. obviously Stamkos lost it at the end, but it was down to, well, he had, he only had one card left that he could even potentially hit. Like, like I don't know. It, it, and they did that a couple times, him and Pavelski. Um, and it was one of those, like, I also feel like, because, you know, you obviously pick Pavelski, I pick Stamkos. So it was very close and tense for us with, mm-hmm. with our predictions. But I feel like the whole as long as you got to 21 to match anybody that would have gotten a, you know, a blackjack kind of thing, you were okay. So like Stamkos opens with the slapper, like arguably more skilled. Like I'm just going to get whatever I get and then I'll get to 21 from there. Cause like, I just trust myself to do that. Like, but, but it meant that, you know, then Pavelski had the leg up on him the entire rest of the time. Cause he got there first kind of thing Mm -hmm. and on everybody else. So it was just kind of like this weird, like, why didn't Pavelski just win it straight up for getting the 21 off just the two cards? Right. You'd think if they were to kind of do it that way, where that is better just to get the blackjack, then, then he should have won. I don't know. It it was a little confusing. But they just let everybody go until they got to 21, which, of course, they all did. Like, it was... I don't know that they accounted for them being as good as they were at hitting these cards. They must He's like, not oh, have. you start out with a three. Okay, you're not good. Mm-hmm. No, of course you're getting 21 because you, <laughs> you're you an NHL player. Right, and you can do basic addition. <laughs> I, guess mm-hmm. they, I guess that was the only other thing that maybe could have tripped them up at that point, but they managed to pass that test. But yeah, it was it was just weird because like, why not just have them go like like regular blackjack? Like you, you take your shots and then you get to a number that you're comfortable with. Like you don't want to bust and go over. So maybe you hold at 18 or something instead of going for a three somewhere. And then it goes to the next guy. Like, I don't know. It was it was just weird. I, I, I wasn't a fan of how that one went down. I had high hopes for it. But yes, I think if you moved them back, that would have been different. Maybe. Yes. Maybe it wouldn't have. Maybe the puck, it's got like the spinning trajectory. It's like a bullet thing. Like it's just going to move in the line it's moving, regardless of how kind of far back it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's something to take as a lesson for the next time. If you're going to do something similar, move them a little bit further back. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe not have lights right behind all the cards so they're not shattering lights all the time. Or if you're going to do it, make them lights like that, like explode brilliantly, like in the natural. <laughs> Don't just no, tell me, great. oh, they that broke a light great. and I have no way of seeing that they broke a light. <laughs> yeah, just taking their word for it, like, oh, whoops. <laughs> yeah. Um, otherwise, Jordan Kairou went in fastest skater. Good, good for him. We kind of talked about him in the predictions for us. Neither of us picked him, but it was mostly because we kind of said, like, we haven't really seen much of him. We have we don't really know how fast he can be. Apparently he's pretty darn fast. Yeah, that's for sure. And it, you know, from what I've seen, he seemed pretty fast, but against, you know, former champ and Dylan Larkin, you know, McDavid, we all know how fast mm-hmm. he is. Uh it was just hard to pick him ahead of those guys, but hey, congrats to Cairo. Yeah. And uh Hedman, of course, won hardest shot. Not a real surprise there. Again, without a Weber or a Chara until somebody steps up. It's just not exciting. Nope. I mean, those first shots, too, coming in around 90 miles an hour. What was under. that about? I, I think the guys, you know, you need a warm-up shot. you got to break things in. Clearly, for everyone, that was the pattern. But still, it, it well, kind of came out from... Except for Hedman, yeah. But from the start, you're like, okay, this is uh, not going to be the kind of, you know, Weber-Chara duel that we had seen in the past. Yeah. And then... Um odd making the saving you know the save streak a tandem event i did not like that. i did not like that either 
because I remember when they implemented the save streak, I think it was 2019 where I went to that one. And that was actually really fun because there were individual goalies, individual guys that you kind of root for or not. And you could tell the goalies really took pride in it versus in a tandem. It's just like, well, what can I do? There's so much that's out of your hand. Like the goalies just didn't seem to care as much. No, I mean, I get John Gibson, just I'm stuck with Thatcher Demko. What can I do? Oh, oh come on. <laughs> Well, that's that's how it played out. Yeah, we'll we'll see. Uh, get to the uh, the All Star game itself later, and and talk about John Gibson. Nah, well, so I've, it's, I've it's got a, an axe to it's grind. A, it's an All Star game, and nobody does doesn't mean anything. Um, all right. So then, then the last thing to talk about, really, and the thing that was certainly the most talked about, and it's the most talked about every year, which is the you know the the performative. I forget what it's exactly called, but the shootout thing mm-hmm what's, yeah, the, the, what's it called signature uh, shootout it, something yes yeah, so, or is it um you, breakaway challenge breakaway challenge breakaway something challenge? like that yeah i don't know they need to they need to it, find a name for it it's a prop contest now yeah it's it's strictly a, a, a prop contest and a performative event uh because my big gripe on twitter was the two people who actually scored finished <laughs> in the bottom two spots it's uh <laughs> in a breakaway contest like what's that about how does that happen yeah i mean it well by the by knowing who the winner was you could definitely see how important uh really anything of substance was and that's not very <laughs> yes. uh, you know we'll get to that in a little bit but yes i, I know you were making the argument for zegris um i was making the early argument for hughes the more i go back and look at it I, I do think Zegris deserved to win. I will. I will admit you're right there. I think Hughes certainly deserved to come in second place because mm -hmm. I thought that I thought that was cool. I liked you know the, the element of it. I liked you know having the mini Jack Hughes I'll, and the, the uh, synchronized stick throw over the glass. Yeah. I thought was cool. Um, but on first watch, I actually didn't realize that Zegris had had pulled off that move perfectly. I was on the first camera angle because i was just trying to follow it quickly it looked like all these dodgeballs were coming in or whatever i didn't yeah. follow where the puck actually went but he actually pulled off that move while blindfolded while having these dodgeballs mm -hmm. thrown at him yeah. which i didn't notice at first before you i know, didn't either about no the first camera angle you couldn't notice like I was, exactly i don't know how the announcers knew he scored i think they just looked at reactions of other people but yeah i mean uh, looking at the replay and i get it was he probably a hundred percent blind in that blindfold no he wasn't <laughs> you, he could see through it everybody knows you can see through a really light you know blind like that that being said the move itself is almost enough you throw in the dodgeballs that already takes it to a next level and then having anything impeding your ability to see a hundred percent like the angle you look at that the sharp angle he pulls that off is absolutely incredible uh, uh, like there's a goalie in net it's not just hitting an empty net here like you're yeah. you're actually still beating a goalie right i mean that was incredible i mean, just the the skill everything it did not disappoint we were expecting something big from trevor zegris i think we all were mm -hmm. and uh, he delivered and more yeah no the nhl got what they wanted from from bringing him in as the special guest i yep. liked that um and the whole dodgeball thing i mean that was just fun being in vegas like like bringing in that aspect of it i thought that was really clever and and really interesting absolutely i love the movie dodgeball you know of course set in vegas there mm -hmm. i mean just leaning into it he's got the peter lafleur jersey on yep. uh that was awesome yeah uh as for the jack hughes thing my only issue with the jack hughes thing was that it took a really, really long time and you could like see where it was going for a really long time. Like we didn't know that it was going to be a mini Jack Hughes coming out, but like, you know, that like there was going to be someone coming out of that box and he's got to do like this, this performative magic thing beforehand. And it was just like, let's, let's, let's go. Like, this is kind of cheesy. Like, come on. Um, but this, the stick toss was by far and away the best part for me yeah that's that's what did it for me i was just like oh this is pretty cool the stick toss I'm like okay this is great yeah uh i think yeah. it would have been cool if he had like all the hughes brothers come out of that box then i would have been impressed like oh wow okay that that would have been stuffed really in his little box like <laughs> <laughs> that's magic yeah uh otherwise it was just kind of like whatever and then poor kaprizov like yeah again he scores does the tribute to ovechkin all that stuff and just like the moment it's over, just completely forgotten, not mentioned again. The whole rest of that segment felt really yeah, completely bad for him. Overshadowed by everything following. Again, I th I thought it was cool, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it 
right. the, the big guns came out and and didn't he switch hands for that because isn't he I a lefty so. yeah yeah he is yeah so he he switched made the move did everything scored righty and mm-hmm. just no 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 yeah this is that's one of those that definitely places you know is in the conversation for winning or places you know in the top three certainly in previous years yeah you just got overshadowed by everything that happened this year. Yeah. By uh by by Petrangelo's, you know, little LEDs on his jersey. Just... Can can are are we going to we have to talk about this, don't we? I mean, I, we could just mention that. First off, the celebrity like voting thing. Let's get rid of that because obviously Terrible. it's not Scrap it. uh, obviously it's not very good. Whoever the ventriloquist was that they were doing, like the fact <laughs> that you're holding up little playing cards and no one can see what the score is. And the judges are just like, yeah, we have no like the, the commentators, I mean, are just like, I have no idea what he's scoring this. So we can't tell who's winning. Like, I was yeah. just like, this is bad. <laughs> I mean, it's it's tough because all it takes is one or two really bad celebrity judges to ruin everything. Cause I, I think a lot of them did yeah, exactly. I think a lot of them did fine. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and, um, but John Hamm, I, who I already knew he, from the start, he was going to ruin it because if you watched, I think they interviewed him beforehand. Yeah. He and said he said he something, was. he's like, yeah, my boy Petrangelo. Yeah. He, he, I like his odds tonight, you know? So, I mean, thank you, John Hamm for, like single-handedly ruining that <laughs> the skills competition or doing whatever you can to ruin it really yeah. um but uh yeah the 19 and the uh, and the fact they gave him that i i didn't think they were actually going to count that no i mean look i get it you get you let the hometown boy win whatever like again that would all be fine I, it's kind of weird to me that it's even scored at all like i almost don't want it scored like i just want yeah. everybody to go and do it and then we just talk about whichever one was best at the end like isn't that yeah, how it know, used to be yeah, I think so. I'm trying to remember. I know that in the past that they've had like judges and scores or whatever, or they had some kind of voting thing, but that's how it should be. Just have everyone yeah. do their thing and we all just get to discuss it. Yeah. Like, cause that's what gets the conversation going. That's what makes it the most fun. And, you know, certainly if you have, if you're going to rig it, mm-hmm. like, yeah. And, okay. It's Cause, one cause thing. No I, one's talking about Petrangelo if that's the case. Yeah. It's true. It's true. But I, like, I, one thing that I, I, I want to talk about, because, like, I think it's okay. I get it. Like, rigging it for the home guy, but you've got to make it close. Mm-hmm. You've got to make it close. You can't fail in every single regard. Like, did it light up? What even happened there? I just saw that there was a jersey with a little pink thing. Did it light up like it was supposed to? It did. I didn't notice anything. It did. Okay. But, but he never faced the camera. That's what it was. Okay. Because the camera's behind him as he's going in to shoot. So they turned it on for the shot attempt. And then he goes in and shoots, and you can't see it. Mm-hmm. That's a problem. So long, yeah. The timing with the like the drummers seem off, and then he misses the net Yeah, on the shot attempt. Like, it failed every single stage along the way, basically. It was just, you know, if he, if he pulled off whatever he was supposed to pull off, and it came out and it looked good, like, okay, you executed on what you were trying to do. Like, oh, the home guy won. But it just failed every step of the way. It was... Uh, yeah and and it was like the the drum thing when he interacted with them felt off the cuff at first but then you realized it was staged and i was like ooh, <laughs> like then this is not <laughs> he's not a not a good actor none of them are but you know <laughs> it's yep. just uh zegris yep. was robbed that's just the end of it <laughs> yep i agree otherwise though i mean it was still fun it, it's always fun like like as as you know rough as maybe the broadcast aspects of it were and and then bringing in the scoring there it was still a lot of fun great way to spend a friday night i had a lot of fun live tweeting with everybody that was fun thanks for everybody who was engaging with me and stuff that was <laughs> that was cool um should, should we talk about everly now or should we should we do the all-star game first because obviously uh, i mean it is a deep dive we're, t- we're here to talk about the kraken but you yeah. know, I mean, this 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 is really what everybody wants to hear about. Yeah, I, I think I think we should talk about the All Star Game first, and that way, then we can get into Everly's role in both the skills competition and All Star Game. Kind of put it together for the whole All Star Weekend. Okay. So we can just quickly talk about the All Star Game. All right, then RJ, you talk about the All Star Game because I didn't watch. You know, I don't blame you. Uh, I'm kind of surprised that I did watch. I'll be honest, I turned it off right around the start of the final game of the All Star Game. Uh, which again, I not 
it's Again, a weird format. You got to rename it if it's a tournament. Call it the All Star Tournament, the All Star mm-hmm. Tourney, something. But to call it an All Star Game, and then I'm constantly thinking like, well, games, like it's just weird. Yeah, it is. I, I, I was trying to figure out how to tweet about it as I'm talking about it. Like, well, the second game of the All Star Game. Yeah, it's, it it's just a odd. Lot of sense. But uh, yeah, you didn't you didn't miss a whole lot. I mean, there was a cool Jordan Everly goal that we'll, yeah, we'll get. Yeah, I to. saw that. But um, other than that, not not really a whole lot. I mean, it's it's what you'd expect. It's kind of guys half trying. I well, half is generous, but guys half trying, and then uh, you know some from few gimmicks on the side. My favorite part was Tyreek Hill uh, joining the broadcast there. I don't know if you saw that. Mm-mm. Okay, so he goes on, gives a very interesting interview where he uh, challenges Usain Bolt. To a rate, okay. uh, to a race. I also like that they did grill him about why did you lose to Micah Parsons? How did you lose to the linebacker? Yeah. He's like, I didn't want to show my stuff. You know, I'm basically saying he's trying to, uh, you know, lure Usain Bolt into this false sense of security, trying to get him to race him, uh, and then takes a couple beers, smashes them together, sprays it all over, gets really wet and everything, and then just gives this stare at the camera. <laughs> it was pretty good. I would encourage you to go back and watch it. All while um, Jack Campbell is getting scored on, and you just see Leafs goalie looking up after giving up a goal. Uh, the juxtaposition was uh, really good. Yeah. Uh, who even won? I don't even like. I don't even know who won. Uh, the Metropolitan Division. Oh, okay. I mean, that's the one I probably doing my best uh, Marshall So impression there. Yeah. That was, oh my gosh, what a nightmare that was. Yeah, I mean, you talk about certain things. It seemed like anything with the whole Vegas home crowd, the Vegas players, was not planned out well enough. We talked about mm-hmm. Petrangelo just there. But uh, um, it was reported somewhere. I forget who reported it. But, like, the story behind the March, the Marcia So thing. You know, there was a magic trick, and he was supposed to read out the card, right, that mm-hmm. said who they were playing, and he just didn't say anything. Yeah. And then the magician was like, the Metropolitan Division, <laughs> you know. Um but apparently Marcia, so they they told him, all right, here, like three minutes before, here, you're going out here. You don't have to say anything. They're just going to do this trick. You just have to go out there. Okay. And so he's thinking, okay, I don't, I'm not supposed to say anything. Right. I don't want to mess up his trick if I'm not supposed to say what's on the card, yeah. which is exactly what I would have done. Like, I yeah. totally get that. So he's just put in that spot and yeah. Just yeah. I mean, good. I had to figure that was the case. Uh, mm-hmm. Got to assume Jonathan Marcheseau can read. Because <laughs> yep. I know that's what everybody was kind of like questioning, but everybody knew like that's not the case. Like something is going on here. That makes a lot of sense. They do that to athletes, especially hockey players, a lot. Just go mm-hmm. out there, don't do anything, don't say anything, just stand there. <laughs> and it's like... Uh... And then all of a sudden he's got a line. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and then somebody throws it at him and they're just like, uh... Uh, yeah and you said i just didn't want to mess up his trick if i wasn't supposed to say that like i get that yeah i totally get it it makes a lot of sense to me um it was yeah it was just some of the some of the broadcasty stuff and then the carrot top thing like they have carrot top yell at them to do i forget exactly what it was to start something or to get oh, it was going it, was it on the starting the petrangelo thing no no it was before oh, that was... it was like huh. during the save the save something the the save streak thing maybe I don't remember, but they have him like yell. The camera zooms in on him. He's clearly mic'd up, but he only does it once. And then he just kind of stands there and sits back down. I was like, I thought it was going to at least be a bit. I'm like, mm-hmm. Carrot pop, carrot Top, master of prop comedy. Like, give him some hockey props. Maybe he can do something. Like, this could be fun. Him in the stands interacting with people. No. <laughs> give him a three-second line and then that's it. Yeah. I was like, all right. That was, like, why? <laughs> I don't know. It was Espen. They're figuring it out. It was their first time. It's probably going to go smoother in Florida next year. Um, it's going to be fun to see what kind of, like, swamp-based skills they can bring in, though. They're not going to have the Bellagio <laughs> fountain, but maybe it's, you know, some Happy Gilmore type thing where you got to shoot a puck into an alligator's mouth and then go and, and wrestle him for it. Oh, that would be fun. I think they're going to lean into the whole beach, you know, thing, which, but you should lean into the swamp aspect. Do that. This is the only NHL arena built in a swamp. You got to do that. (laughs) Uh, It'd be be fun. Um, All right. So Jordan Eberle, obviously the Seattle Kraken's representative at the all-star game. Thought he did pretty good, you know, as far as doing that. He was on social media and stuff. Like, there was, you know, pictures of him with his kid, all that. Um, 
I thought he was pretty good. Yeah, I thought he represented the team well. I think it's, a, again, it, skill performance, it doesn't really matter, but I think overall it's a representation that Kraken fans can be proud of as mm -hmm. their first ever All-Star. I think he represented the team, represented the city well. Um, you know, he did fine in the Fountain Challenge. You know, he didn't he didn't embarrass himself there or anything, you know. Um, and he scored a goal in the All-Star game, and he said that was actually important to him. He said, you know, I wanted to mm -hmm. make sure to get the first, you know, Kraken All-Star goal, so I was really trying to get that one. Uh, and he did a good job there, scored on the breakaway, and hopefully that gets him going, you know, it, back in the NHL games, you know, he's on a bit of a cold streak goal scoring wise. Um, but yeah, I, I thought um, he did well, and, and it was cool to see all the pictures too, because uh, he said afterward, you know, the, his favorite part was getting to spend the time with his family, particularly his his young daughter who, mm -hmm. you know, got to go to everything, got to follow him around and see him there. And he mentioned, he's like, you know, she's not going to remember this, but I will, and we'll have the pictures. And I think that's going to be just a great moment, you know, for him and for his family that they can always look back at. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's always my favorite part of it is when the players have their families with them, especially their kids. Uh, anytime they let them like bring the kids kind of onto the ice and stuff like a lot of my favorite skills competition memories are of them you know trying to wrangle in their kids or their kids interacting with the other players and stuff you know what i mean that they might not get to see see which players are interacting with the kids that's always fun mm -hmm. for me like like which ones which ones are you guys you know really really like 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 that interaction you know what i mean um and, and the games that they'll play with them and stuff like like i miss that sometimes uh not too much of it this go around really which was unfortunate but um because i mean oh what was it was it brent burns's kids that one year and pavelski and pavelski yeah yeah their they, kids yeah. were just running all over the place well skating but <laughs> you know what i mean they were just all over it, the it's place fun when they can skate and they get on the ice mm -hmm. and everything obviously uh you know everly's daughter too young for that but yeah um but it, it's also nice it, Sometimes you don't always see the extent of that too. Like I, that's one thing I learned at the 2017 one in LA where things that the cameras never really picked up, but like seeing Carrie Price just hold mm -hmm. his like ba basically baby, just like, mm -hmm. I, you know, amazing. They just have like a baby on the ice, but just, you know, kind of carrying them around and just like, you know, almost like fly, you know, look, you're flying. It's an yeah. airplane, you know, as he's skating around, like, and, and to see just the pure joy on his face doing that. I, that's just something I'm always going to remember from that all-star game. Yeah, it's, and that's what it's all about. We we want to see the players. We want to see who they are. We want to be connected to them. That's what All Star <laughs> games are all about. It's originally maybe it was about okay having the best versus the best, but it's certainly not what it's been the last twenty years in any of the sports. Totally, uh, baseball they're at least playing for something. So like there's <laughs> something to that. Uh, they're playing for you know home field advantage later in the year, but you know pro bowl is today as we're recording nobody's trying like it's not a best v best thing nobody wants to get hurt and the all-star game in hockey is pretty similar nobody wants to get hurt they want to put on a show and for the most part in hockey i do think the three on three thing has made it so that there is more of a show because like you can yeah. see them you know the best players trying fun passes trying that kind of stuff um i do think that that was a, a fun a, you know move in that regard for the NHL, but um, a lot of it comes down to the skills competition, not just because the skills themselves are fun, but because that's where we get to see all the personalities of all the players that we love and the players that we don't know we're going to love until they're there. Like a lot of mm -hmm. people really fell in love with Jack Hughes and, and Trevor Zegras because of this, just their interactions in Vegas and there, you know, how they interacted with each other and stuff like that was big for the game. These are two superstars that are going to be around for a long time. You want to get that exposure to the national audience that doesn't necessarily see New Jersey Devils games or Anaheim Duck games on the other coast. You know what I mean? And so um, in that sense, it was all successful. Yeah, and I think Jack Hughes and Trevor Zegras gained a lot more fans, too, after mm -hmm. after this weekend. And that's going to be huge for them and the game. Now, one more thing I want to talk about with Everly's performance at the All-Star Game. Now, I know you didn't watch the All-Star Game, but notably, he went offside. He was called for offside. Yeah. That's rare. Yeah. I was shocked when I saw like the, the tweets and everything about that. I was like, what? They're doing this? Really? It's a review? Like, what is happening? <laughs> I mean, it, was, it, was, it, was it super obvious? It was pretty obvious. He was, he was like more, because 
it's one of those where you're, you know, you're you're on the other side of the line. You know, you're in the offensive zone. You try and cut back to receive a pass, mm -hmm. but the defenseman just kind of kept pushing him so he couldn't get back to the line. Um, but he just clearly touched the puck anyway. He could have you know backed off and not gone offside. But I don't know if you saw his uh, his answer when asked about that because apparently he was mic'd up and i would have liked to hear more from him because they only really talked to him once on the bench uh but it was right after he went offside they asked about it, and he said well i was talking to the ref on that last stop they said they needed a tv timeout they needed a stoppage or something so i wanted to give it to him yeah i i saw that on on twitter i thought that was a really fun uh fun way of covering for it yeah i mean again mic up the players and then actually talk to them we didn't really get yes. much of that this weekend not like we've had in years past, it felt like. Anyway. Yeah. I know they tried, I think it was Talbot that they were trying to talk to. Yeah. One of the goalies. Yeah. But it just wasn't working. They had mm -hmm. some technical difficulties. But those are the most fun ones when you can talk to a goalie throughout the All-Star game as they're facing shots mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, make sure to get that right for next time because those are the best. For sure. Not going to be the only, at least, you know, we talked about the skills competition. It's not going to be the only skills competition that we have to talk about, though, RJ. That is because true. before the next episode of this podcast, the Kraken will have had their skills competition in Seattle. Only the Kraken showing up doing stuff. So based on, you know, having kind of skills in our minds, having kind of a fresh look at these things, let's go ahead and try to make some predictions for what we think is going to happen at this Kraken skills competition. We don't know really all of the events, so mm -hmm. we're going to have to guess a little. We, we got to think that the staples are going to be there. Hardest shot we well hardest shot we know will be there, fastest skater got to think that's going to be there the um the accuracy challenge the shooting the styrofoam things as fast as possible thing has got to be there, um that those are those are just staples so kind of real quick R J who do you who do you think is going to win those for the Kraken? All right, so I mean we'll kind of go skill by skill here, um I guess we'll start with hardest shot. Yeah, I mean it's the one we know was happening. Yeah, I mean, here, here's, like, let's see what we know is happening. It says, we'll show off their speed, accuracy, strength, and chirping abilities. That includes finding out who is our fastest skater, who can juggle a puck on their stick the longest, who has the most accurate shot. Uh, most, uh, most accurate shot. Of course, I can't imagine they wouldn't do hardest shot. So we'll start with hardest shot. Now, I would say my favorite would be Jamie Alexiak, because we've seen how much size plays into this. But I don't know that he's going to be healthy, you know, and able to do this mm -hmm. in time. We just don't know. So... Assuming he's not going to be able to do it, I'm going to say Morgan Geeky. Okay, interesting. I, size plays a factor too, but it's interesting because uh, with these, I've seen these players practice so many times this season. I've seen a lot of reps, a lot of different things in practice. Um, and Geeky's slap shot just looks the hardest to me when he really gets into it of all the guys. And I think size plays a factor in that. Um, I think he's going to be smart enough to know to keep the puck down low because it's going to register better uh, for the speed on the radar. So uh, that he's going to be my pick. I, well, I think he's a good pick. I was going to say, don't they all know to keep it low now? Like you it's been talked so? about so much. You would think so, but I don't know. Um, I'm going to go Adam Larson. Ooh, I, okay. I think we've seen his is at least a heavy shot. Like he gets rebounds like nobody else. And I got to think velocity plays into that. So I think we don't really see him unleash. I think he takes some off of it in games because he's trying to pick his spots. But I think if Adam Larson just goes for it, it's going to be him. You know, I, I I do like that pick. I know that you're a big believer in the at least like the heaviness of his shot. Uh, just OK, before we get into these further ones, though, just just tell us ahead of time, please. Are you going to pick Adam Larson as the winner for every single thing? I know you're probably tempted to. Maybe not fastest skater. Maybe. Okay. That being said, he's got the, the most perfect stride. So maybe over the course of a full rink, you know, that 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 equals something. Form beats, you know, raw power. Okay. So we'll try and spread it around if we can. Let's let's go fastest skater next then. Okay. All right. So fastest skater, I gotta go with Yanni Gord. Um he's the guy that I noticed from the first day of training camp, and I'm like, whoa, he's just noticeably faster than anybody else out here um and i know on a full lap it's kind of different as where you've got some straight line parts you've got to get your crossovers i just think he's also you know one of the more polished skaters too i think he'll win and it wouldn't surprise me if it's by a wide margin 
Yeah, no, it's it. He's a really good choice. There's not too many guys that I think about. Like like Tanev would have been someone I would have considered mm-hmm. here. Obviously, he's not going to be competing. Um, you know, one of the guys that comes to mind is Mason Appleton. He's he's pretty fast. Um, we know he can be, but maybe more so straight line. So I don't know how the how the corners and everything will come into it. I don't know. It's it's tough. I I like the Yanni Gord pick. I'm really tempted to go there as well. But because you already picked him, yeah, I think I have to go Mason Appleton. I'm trying to think of like the forwards we've seen get back the fastest, like back checking right. and stuff, you know. And what would have been really interesting to see is Carson Kuhlman. I don't. He won't be mm-hmm. able to compete i don't think but um you know we know that the reputation is he's fast we haven't got to see a whole lot of him it'd be a cool introduction if he could go out and win that one uh but uh, unfortunately he probably won't be competing yeah so i think if, if appleton can stay up right through the corners i think i think mm-hmm. he's got a shot him and donskoy yeah donskoy is another one that, that i was thinking about that may, may be him yeah uh can we just agree though we don't want blackwell in this Yes, I mean, please no. <laughs> just he he might hurt himself. At the very least, he's gonna take like a minute, just because he's gonna keep falling down and uh, bumping into things. So let's yeah, let, maybe we'll save him the embarrassment and the potential injury. Maybe. Yeah, this is definitely the worst downside if you can't stay upright. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let's avoid that. Although the exception I'd say to that is the men with all the pads, the goalies. I do want to see them mm-hmm. compete in it. I, I want to see the goalies do this. I know. We'll we'll see. I don't know how much the goalies are going to do. Like I don't know if they'll do a save streak type thing or you know really have them try in any sort of meaningful shootout type thing just cuz obviously that's that's the one you really don't want someone getting hurt in. Exactly. <laughs> and the Kraken cannot have another goalie injury. You just not, can't. Not, just not like right in the middle of a stretch of games like that too. Yep. Yeah, they will have played the previous night, by the way. Yes. So uh, it's, it's going to be interesting. All right, what uh, what do we got next? All right, next we've got accuracy shooting. And I feel bad about the uh, you know taking Gord up for the fastest skater to pass. So I'll let you have the first pick for the accuracy shooting. Who you got? Oh, boy. All right. So we we talked about when we did it on the Red Glare podcast for the NHL one, for the, for yes. the All-Stars game skills competition one, that, you know, a lot of people might have been tempted to pick um oh my gosh i'm totally blanking what was his name the, the guy with the oh troy terry for that mm-hmm. in that and i was saying you know troy terry's got the hardest fastest wrist shot but those guys tend to just sail it you know high and wide a lot like they 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 don't know how right. to take a little bit off for that touch that you might need and i and i feel like mccann's that way too his his shot i mean we see it every game right like if he if he had the pinpoint accuracy with that full speed, it would be going in even more than it already does. But he he hits glass a lot, and I think, you know, he might be considered the early favorite. But for that reason, I'm not gonna pick him. You read my mind on McCann, by the way. Yeah. So for that reason, I'm not picking Jared McCann. I like Eberle in this. I really do. I think he can do it. I think he's got the soft touch, the the soft hands that can get this done. Um. It's it's going to be interesting. Don't count out someone like a Vince Dunn, though, either. I mm-hmm. think we've seen him play some really nice pucks. I think if you give him the ability just to kind of stand there and play stuff, I think he's got that in his skill set. But I, I'm going to play it kind of safe and go Everly. Okay, good. So now I don't feel bad about the fast skater thing because I was going to say McCann is the trap pick mm-hmm. and Everly's who you want to go with. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly watching him in practice and everything – it feels like more than half the times that someone just hits a perfect bar down shot, you look over and it's Everly. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think he'll probably win that one, but I'll go with someone else here. Cause you picked him. Um, I'm going to go with, okay, this is, this is going to seem weird, but Jonas Donskoy. Okay. No, I mean, I get it. Yep. I, I know Mr. Can't score a goal to save his life for the accuracy shooting, but when he actually does shoot a lot of his, you know, not scoring goal was just, kind of passing up chances. He wasn't really trying to be too opportunistic with that, but just given him the net, I think he can pick a spot pretty well. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think he's a good choice for this as well. Um, it, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see how a lot of guys do. Cause I think we could be surprised by some down the lineup and stuff. Like I, I think we could be surprised by some of the defensemen too, not mm-hmm. just like done, but like, like a, a decent amount of them. Uh, it's yeah. going to be interesting. I got to throw his name out here for the actually shooting Hayden flurry. I thought about him too. Yep. yep. So we'll we'll see. 
Maybe we'll get a surprise there. All right. And then puck juggling? Who could who could bounce a puck the longest? Is that right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Who can juggle a puck on their stick the longest? So this is a tough one to pick, right? I mean, mm. how do you... You can look at just, you know, good hands in general. I try and look for guys that I've seen try this the most, um, you know, in practices, morning skates, whatever, because, you know, guys will just be messing around and do this. And what I always notice is that the Swedes like to do it. And usually, like, they'll try and kind of pass it between themselves to juggling the puck. So the Swedes, I think, Wenberg, Jaren Kroak, and Johansson. Mm -hmm. So I, I got to pick one of those guys. I think, you know, I'll, I'll go Alex Wenberg. Okay. Because the puck usually seems to kind of end up on his stick or he'll juggle it the most in my, you know, just anecdotal memories here. So I'm going to go with Alex Wenberg. All right. See, I think they might be the most skilled with keeping the puck in the air longest, all those Swedes. I got, mm -hmm. you forgot Adam Larson, by the way. Well, he's not, no, he's not part of the group that does it. I know, but he's, but he's Swedish, so you know he's capable of it. That's and true. he's great at everything. Uh, that, that helps too. But, I, you know, it, that sounds too much like they do it as a unit, as a team. They 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 do it together. This It'll is, throw them off when they're this individual. Is, yeah, this is going to be a solo thing. The pressure's going to get to them. It's it's a different thing. You're not trying to do it more laterally. Like this is straight up and down, and that's where the uh, the 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 forearm strength that Jared McCann has that's going to do him in in the accuracy competition. That's where it's going to help him here, though, is because he's going to be able just to muscle this thing around where he wants it. Mm. And uh, so I'm going to go Jared McCann. Okay. All right. That's that's a good pick there. So now we're kind of off the board as far as what, uh, you know, we know is guaranteed, you know, as far as events that there's going to be. But um, let's see. What else do we have? What do you, what do you think there's going to be? I mean, I want there to be, obviously they said chirping. So there's going to be something there. I've brought it up before. I'd love like some sort of Yo Mama competition. Maybe not exactly Yo Mama, but just like <laughs> a battle of words. Um, the I, I got to think though, that there's going to be some sort of fun shootout thing. Again, yes, that way the goalies don't, it, the, yeah. the way the goalies don't have to try too hard or anything. Go ahead with the name. No, I was just going to say, let's let's call it basically what the NHL did with that breakaway challenge, whatever it was. Yeah. Let's say it's pretty similar to that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that we're going to see quite the same level of showmanship from like a prop perspective, bringing in a bunch of extras to throw you know, rubber balls at you or a drum line. But I got to think that they're going to do something like that for these guys and for the fans, really, because who's not going to want that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like that's going to be, I think, you know, certainly one of the highlights of this whole thing. I think seeing the success of it at the NHL skills competition level, not just this year, but in past years, mm -hmm. you know, they have to do something like that. So as far as a winner who, cause we got to have, we have no idea what they're going to pull out of their hat, what ideas they're going to have, who's even going to be competing in this. That's like, Hey, I know what I can do. Who do you think is going to do it? Who do you think is going to you know, take it away. Cause it's tough because I, we'd think if he was healthy, Brandon Tanev. Well, I was going to say, do you think, do you think it could still be Brandon Tanev? I think it, okay. I think it could be, like, but I when think was his more surgery? likely somebody, so <laughs> it was, it was what end of very end of December, but I, I think it's probably someone's going to incorporate him into what they do. Yeah. I think that's, that's, more, that's likely. more likely. Yeah. You're right. Um, Cause I was going to say that would, that would do it. Even if he doesn't do anything fancy, just seeing him on skates again or something like mm -hmm. that would, that would be the winner for sure. Um, ah, this is tough. I'm trying to think, you know, I like, I like Don Skoy here a lot. Mm -hmm. We've seen his personalities. I, I like him and Donato, both of them, the, the Donnie's there. I, <laughs> I think they could do something fun. They could do something fun together. Even mm -hmm. I think that could be interesting, but I, it's tough. I don't know. Yeah. This one's a I, hard one. It is. It is. My first thought was Donato, mm -hmm. but now thinking about the two of them together. I mean, that's an unstoppable kind of pair if they do something yeah, together. Yeah, I don't think you can beat that. No, I, I don't either. Otherwise, if we're if we're looking away from them, I'm trying to think, you know, don't count out Giordano. Mm. I think I think he's he's got like a sneaky fun personality and stuff like he's been like, OK, in the leadership position for a long time now, uh, both here and in Calgary. So he hasn't done it. But like we've also seen him have have some like cheeky answers to questions and stuff throughout, you know, the mm -hmm. course of his career and whatnot. Uh, 
I, I could see him pulling something out, incorporating people, other people into it and, and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other names to watch, I'd say Yanni Gord and Morgan Geeky. I mean, Yanni Gord, just, you know, he smiling all the time. I, I could see him come up with something. And then like Morgan Geeky, he's already kind of a, this fan favorite here. You know, some of his interview answers. You could have Pizza Hut. Some well, kind I was going to say, Hut, if you know? Pizza Hut's not involved, he's failed. Yes. So it's got to be something Pizza Hut related, but I I think he could probably come up with something good like that. Yeah, uh, I agree. It, either way, that's going to be the most fun thing. They have to do it. Come on. Yes. If anybody listening within the Kraken organization listening right now, if it's not on the docket, put it on the docket. Scrap, scrap, whatever else you got going. This has got to happen. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All uh, right. So did we cover chirping? If, we, if there is some kind of contest yeah see that's the thing is like i don't know what kind of contest you do outside of a yeah. debate type thing you know yeah and that that could not backfire but that could just be awkward it would be very awkward because <laughs> yeah. you know it's it it basically turns into an event where you're waiting to see if somebody accidentally goes too far and you don't want right. that to be the event <laughs> no. no you certainly don't um let's see uh i, I think that's everything yeah, that's everything that we know of. I, I'm interested to see what other surprises they might have in store, what other events they've come up with. Mm -hmm. I know they've got some really good people in the organization coming up with ideas. Um, this yeah, just we'll see what they do. This just occurred to me. Okay, when I was yeah. like two, three, learning how to skate, mm -hmm. right? The instructors and and most ice skating instructors, at least all the ones I've seen in California, right? They use markers out on the ice. And they'll do little things, little paths for you to follow, that kind of stuff. The instructor I had would always then draw fun pictures on the ice and stuff. I want them to kind of section off the ice and make them do some sort of like art challenge where they all got to draw like the Kraken logo or they got to draw Davy <laughs> Jones or something. And I want to see, you know, four or five, six of these guys go out there and on the ice have to draw on the ice yes. see, see who can who not only has the artistic skill but also the ability to kind of view big picture when you can't really see it all you know i mm -hmm. think that would be a lot of fun yeah you know that would be a fun event like, I like they don't have event. to be hockey related skills that's true yeah and, and i'm hoping they they do have some ones that are maybe you know a little bit different um karaoke through yes. the pa system that would do yes it. let's do it yeah, so many possibilities with this. Like, I am so excited. This could be one of the best events of the entire season. Like, yeah. um, that could be the chirping rap battle. Oh, yep. <laughs> I don't know how good anybody would be, but it would be entertaining. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh boy, that would be that would be quite something. A lot of these guys, their second language. Yeah, it's it'd get interesting. <laughs> get really interesting and fun and you know somebody would slip up and say something it would be it would be fun mm -hmm. i i think a lot all right to close things off rj for this episode let's go ahead and um talk about something that we bring up a lot whether it's on either podcast or on the post game lives right and that mm -hmm. is advanced stats we, yep. we use them a lot when we're describing players certainly when we were doing things like our mid-season grades Right, we used them all over the place, but uh, not everybody might know what they are, right? Or certainly, when we throw out things like Corsi or expected goals for or against or anything like that, they might not know what that means. And um, you know, we've had people ask us questions in the post game lives, and we always encourage that. We love when people do that because odds yes. are, if one person has the question, other people have the question. Um, but I think it would be a good idea to kind of just do a quick little breakdown of at least the advanced stats that you and I use a lot and that we think are valuable and just kind of explain what they are to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we should definitely do that. We use these a lot. You might hear them, you know, in, in various things that we do. Uh, and yeah, we should kind of go through and explain what they mean. Yeah. So first one up, I think that we should do is like the traditional possession metrics kind of been around the longest and that's uh, Corsi and Fenwick. Right, yep. Corsi for your Fenwick for and against and all that. And at the end of the day, I mean, I don't, I don't know who you know which of us are going to break down these things and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, the, the main thing is Corsi 
is measuring shots on goal, goals, missed shots, and block shots as far as players taking them when they're on the ice. Uh, Fenwick is literally the exact same thing, only they remove block shots. Right. So, yeah, essentially, Corsi is all shot attempts, mm-hmm. you know, attempts at getting a shot, and Fenwick is unblocked shot attempts. Yeah. So, you know, it's useful when you're looking at it analytically just to see kind of who's driving shot attempts, who's driving offense. And I mean, like at the end of the day, that's really what it's about. So they're called possession metrics, but they're really more so about just who's driving offense. And I think that's maybe sometimes where people get hung up. Right. And the idea is that a shot attempt is basically a proxy for possession Mm -hmm. because you have to possess the puck in order to attempt to shoot it. Yeah. Um, And so it's, you know, in the, you know, you said these are some of the older metrics. These are some of the first, you know, really more advanced ones. You kind of have to use proxies like that because you don't have this advanced, you know, data. You don't have chips in pucks and sticks to see, okay, exactly how much time is each team possessing the puck. So you kind of use shot attempts as a proxy for possession. Right. And for me, my big hang up on that was always like, yes, it makes sense. You had to have had possession if you're attempting a shot. But it's also like shooting is one of the quickest ways to give up possession of the puck. So that's why it's kind of like, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Uh, I, I always get hung up on that. Um, you and I have used these for years now. Like we said, they've been around for a long, long time. Uh, I still think that it's a very valuable tool to look at as as far as just who's making things happen, especially when used in conjunction with zone starts offensive zone starts defensive zone starts seeing where players are starting with the puck players let's say starting in the defensive zone 60 something percent of the time but their Corsi Fenwick four are you know up in the like 55 percent of the time thing then you know that player is do is is doing a good job of getting it out of their zone they're starting in their defensive zone and the puck is ending up in the offensive zone for their team you know they are good at driving possession they are good at making the offense if swing go for their team rather than against their team right and zone starts are another thing that we'll bring up a lot that we'll talk about a lot um and zone starts basically give you an idea of a player's deployment um and it's basically a percentage of the time how often they start the offensive zone as opposed to the defensive zone so if they start the same amount and that's on on a face-off essentially to start play and that's what we mean by start. Yeah. So if they start two face-offs in the offensive zone, two face-offs in the defensive zone, fifty that's 50% offensive zone starts, 50% defensive zone starts, you know, and it's just, you know, this, this ratio essentially as it goes on. So a player that has a higher percentage of offensive zone starts has more of an offensive deployment. They're used, you know, more of an offensive role and higher defensive zone starts means, you know, they have more of a defensive deployment, defensive role. Um, sometimes you'll might hear the word sheltered. And that's, you know, giving a player a high percentage of offensive zone starts. Sometimes you'll see that, you know, maybe with younger players, maybe with players who you need to, again, shelter the, you know, some of their minutes, give them a little more favorable deployment uh, and kind of ease them into things. And so when you look at, you know, zone starts, it tells you another part of the picture as far as how a player is being deployed and gives some context to those Fenwick and Corsi numbers. Yeah, that's why I, I love those two in you know, together, used together, I think that's where you get like kind of the the more full picture. As far as the zone starts by themselves, it's a great insight into what that team's coaching staff thinks of that player. If if that player is starting in the defensive zone, I mean, there are guys sometimes close to 70% of the time. Well, then that tells you that coaching staff knows they can, they, or they, they think that they can rely on that player in a defensive situation where they need, you know, them to step it up and and get the puck out of the zone and make sure nothing bad is going to happen. So there is some value to looking at them both individually and together. The big one, and this is this is more of a recent development, I'd say, RJ, and that's expected goals, expected goals against, and it's kind of taking some of the stuff from Corsi and Fenwick, but kind of to the next level. Right. I mean, you're looking at, you know, shots, shot attempts, that sort of thing, where Corsi and Fenwick are essentially just counting stats. Mm -hmm. They don't make a distinction between, you know, where a shot's coming from, you know, what type of shot it is, shot quality, essentially, it doesn't take into account. Whereas expected goals, expected goals against, um, that's 
an attempt to take shot quality into account as well as just number of shots. So there are lots of different models for this. There are lots of, you know, different, you know, kind of outlets, websites that, that all kind of have their own expected goal model. Some of them take, um, you know, a lot, pretty much all of them take shot position into account. Mm -hmm. They'll sometimes take shot type, whether it's a deflection, slap shot, snapshot, whatever it is. Um, and all these different variables and all kind of put it into a number that is for every shot attempt between zero and one. Now that's the expected goals on that particular shot. One would mean uh, it goes in a hundred percent of the time, a hundred percent of those shots will go in zero means you know, none of those shots will ever go in. And, you know, every shot, it's, you know, shot, you basically have a number in between there. Z like 0 0.5 would mean you can expect that shot to go in half the time mm -hmm. and, you know, so on and so forth. And so then you can kind of add that up. You can do a lot of cool things with it. You can add it up, you know, for, for players, how many expected goals, you know, they generated for teams. You can look at by game, how many expected goals they had versus how many actual goals. You can do lots of cool things with it. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a nice evolution of this. It's it's a nice way of quantifying, uh, you know, a season long performance for an offensive player that maybe, you know, goals. It can be a lucky thing, right? We talked about Donskoy earlier. He's got one goal through forty five ish mm -hmm. games, right? We know he's a better player than that, and this is a way to to prove that. Right. Like he's just gotten unlucky. Hockey has a huge luck factor. If your shot hits the post, sometimes those go in, sometimes they just go out. Like it, it's you have no way of knowing when you take your shot, whether or not it's going to go in. There are games that you're playing a, a goaltender who's just playing out of his mind and he's stopping everything and other times where it's not. And this, you know, takes into account the fact that there are going to be games where you're going to score in those situations that the goalie is just, you know, tonight for whatever reason. It just is unbeatable kind of thing. Um, so I, I like the expected goals a lot. I like that you can quantify individual games, right? And just see like, okay, I thought this player was playing really well, but maybe they were, you know, a minus two because they were out there and something weird happened and it deflected off their defenseman's skate one time or whatever, right? Like, you know, there's no like traditional way of showing that this player played really well or they hit the post like three times. Like, mm -hmm. the, I mean, they're still doing something, right? And so I, I like that this can help you figure out, you know, game by game, okay, this kind of matches with what I was seeing from them. Like, this would have been so valuable back when I was scouting <laughs> to have something yes. like this beyond that I could look to and try to remember beyond just what I was seeing or being able to look at the box score and being like, well, okay, this kid had a goal, but like, maybe it was like an empty netter, right? You don't know yep. all the time. Um, this this helps you out a lot with that for sure. So, and then there's expected goals against, which is the same thing only in reverse kind of it's, it's with goaltenders. It's taking into account how often that shot is expected to go in against the goaltender. Same, same sort of scale and everything. Uh, only, you know, you're, you're measuring how often the goalie should be saving this shot, right? And a negative expected goals against is, you know, maybe they're not performing too well this year. Yeah. And expected goals against has kind of opened up this new realm of goalie stats and goalie stats were an area where it was sorely needed to have some more kind of nuanced goalie stats. If you look at the main ones that had been looked at for a while, um, I mean, you could even start with wins where some goalies, yeah. say, you know, most important stat is wins. And I think we all know that a lot more goes into goalie play than wins and losses. But you look at the other two, you look at goals against average, which basically is, you know, goals against divided by games, you know, and over we know that a lot minutes, of it's yeah. over 60, yeah, over 60 minutes, essentially. And uh, we know that a lot of different things can go into that. Some goalies have good defense, some have bad defense. Mm -hmm. I think we've all seen that, argued about that following the crack in this season. We know there's a lot more that goes into that. And save percentage, which is, you know, saves over shots on goal against. And again, there there are a lot very different shots. You know, mm -hmm. uh, can can mean different things for a goalie. It judges a shot on a three on o the same as it judges this you know easy shot from the blue line that a goalie is going to stop most of the time. So when you have expected goals and you take shot quality into account, um, that allows you to get kind of a, a more accurate, more holistic uh, view of what a goalie can do. Um, and the two stats that have kind of emerged from that. 
or well, I mean, let's just talk about expected goals. Um, sorry, goals saved above expected. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And we will reference that one a lot. And how that works is essentially you just add up all the expected goals against by a goalie, whether it's in a game or a season. Um, and you look at, you know, the goals that you would have expected that goalie to let in. And then you take that and subtract the number of goals that they've actually let in. So, you know, let's say a goalie, um, you know, has had, you know, two ex- over a game and two expected goals against. You'd expect them to have allowed two goals given the quality of the shots, but they only allowed one. You know, they have saved one goal over expected. So they've mm-hmm. essentially, you know, saved their team one goal. Uh, and that kind of adds up over the course of a game, over the course of a season. You know, you go the reverse. If they've only faced one expected goal against, they've allowed two, that's negative one. So the stat essentially starts at zero and then goes up or down, uh, you know, based on how many goals you allow in over or under expected. Yeah. And, and again, it's one of those things. Is it a perfect science? No. Is it a perfect science when it comes to goaltenders? Is anything goaltenders do a perfect science? No, it's really not. We've seen guys, you know, wildly swing within the courses of games, seasons throughout their careers. But it's, it's again, it's, it seems like the best that we've ever had as far as being able to judge goaltenders again game by game kind of season-long performance maybe being able to look at their career so when this goalie hits the free agent market you can look back and see okay they ha- they were outstanding last year you know what i mean like they were they were unbeatable maybe they won the vesna right like they were unstoppable but okay they're you know their expected goals all that stuff it does not track like like this is not a historical <laughs> performance for them like this is not in line with anything maybe that was just a one off year you know they were just feeling it all that kind of stuff and maybe we shouldn't offer that giant contract to that goaltender or vice versa you can find the diamonds in the rough that way you can mm-hmm. look at that at a backup and say like okay well he's you know stuck behind this entrenched starter he only played 17 games last year, but we feel that that's enough of a sample size to look at this and say, well, he was saving all these goals above expected. We think that 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 he's got potential. Maybe we can bring him in and he can be our starter and and we can maybe get him at a discount and, you know, kind of find him before the rest of the league does. So, uh, again, it's just one of those things like the more information you have, you get into that knowledge is power thing. Do you have to worry about overloading on all of this? Yes. Do you, should you take it all as gospel? Probably not, especially some of this goaltending stuff. Mm-hmm. Outlying factors totally affect goaltending. Like it just does. They have to be mentally there, right? Like if they're if they're dealing with a family problem throughout a season, it's going to show up in these numbers, but you shouldn't necessarily take that to to be everything, right? Um, but in general, it's just it's so helpful for front office staffs to kind of get a get a handle on some of these things when they're making their decisions. And then for us as fans to know when is it OK to overreact? When should we be when sh- <laughs> or not to overreact, really? Right. When should be when should we be getting on somebody? When should we be maybe letting off on them? Maybe they're maybe they're playing better than kind of we're perceiving. And we just, you know, not we're not always seeing things or taking into account maybe how difficult a shot from the slot is right Mm -hmm. like it seems like well he saw the shooter that whole way like maybe he should have gotten it well sometimes those can be the most like that's when the goalie has to defend the most area of net yeah and that's and that's an instance where maybe an advanced model like that you know an expected goals model um can kind of take into account more information than someone can on, you know, the eye test, just looking at it. Cause yeah, you can judge, well, okay, he got a full look at it. It was in the slot. It was clean, but it was also a tough area. What an expected goals model could, you know, could potentially do is take thousands of instances of similar shots and look at how often those tend to go in and really get kind of a, a larger grasp informed by data of just how difficult of a shot that is. Um, and you know, it can kind of give a wider context than, you know, a, a person, it's so difficult for, for any one person to have seen thousands of similar attempts like that to really get a firm grasp of how often that goes in, how often, you know, how an NHL goalie can deal with that. Um, so it just kind of provides some wider context. And I think, um, you also touched on an important point, uh, earlier where you talk about like, are these things perfect? 
no. Like, and you know, you don't want to take them all as gospel. And at the end of the day, what you know, some of the these advanced stats, or really, you know, any kind of stat, any bit of information, it just tells you a piece of the story. Uh, and it's important to, I think, gather as many pieces possibly as you can, um, and just try and get as as complete of a picture as you can. Nothing's ever going to tell the full story. There's always things that we can't see that we can't you know, neatly mathematically quantify that are going to be playing into these results. But I think every bit of information, every bit of context that you can gather is going to help you as long as you view it as that, just as context. Exactly. I think that's the important thing to kind of remember through all of these situations, but it's, they're just such helpful tools for, for anybody that's interested in hockey, kind of taking that next step beyond just having fun watching the games. Right. And I do think maybe sometimes when we dig into all this stuff, we maybe lose sight of that sometimes that, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately it's an entertainment product. Got to be aware that we are watching this. We are fans because we want to be fans. We are choosing to emotionally invest ourselves in the performance of people that we have no control over. Like it's important <laughs> to sometimes keep that in mind um, and that we're doing it all for fun and to have fun. But I, I do think that this is another way of kind of adding in that next level, right? And we've all been there where we've gotten into something and we want to take it that one step further because we really love it. And so I think that's the other aspect of uh, you know, advanced stats, fancy stats, all that stuff that it adds is it, it lets us kind of take that, you know, next step to dive deeper and, um, you know, just enjoy the game even more and, and kind of take in more of it uh, if we want to. And so I think that's, you know, another great thing about it, really. I, I certainly know that's been the case for you and I throughout the years. Absolutely. It just opens up these different stories, different things that you don't think about. And I think, you know, everyone's seen it that's a fan of really anything is that you get that deeper knowledge. It kind of helps you, you know, follow it a little bit closer, appreciate it a little bit better and just uh, adds depth to the story. And, and that's, you know, really what this does here. All right. So I want to finish this kind of segment off, RJ, with where do people find this? Right. It's all yes. great if we if we say it during a podcast or during <laughs> a post game live that so and so had X expected goals for this game. Um, but, you know. Got, we got to let people know where they can look at it themselves. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, you look at, you know, when we're covering a game, you know, kind of what, what site websites we have up. And there are a lot of great sources, you know, about this stuff online, um, you know, lots to recommend. And I'm sure, you know, whatever we talk about, we're going to be missing a lot of things here. There's, there's this mm -hmm. whole wide world of things. I think one of the main sources that we have when we are, are watching a game is uh, Natural Stat Trick. Mm -hmm. you know, naturalstatric.com, that kind of gives you, um, and it, what's great about it is it's updated pretty close to live. Mm -hmm. You know, you get the Corsi, the Fenwick, the expected goals uh, for any given game. They have this cool heat map feature where you can look at the rink um, and kind of see where the shots are coming from. It helps you really visualize things. One thing I like about it is it also defaults to five on five uh, for those numbers, which is nice because power plays can kind of skew things. You know, we didn't really get too deep into that today, mm -hmm. but Five on five is good to look at. Um, so that's definitely something I always have up uh, on my computer when watching a game. Yeah. And Money Puck is another place that you can go mm -hmm. to um, for, you know, kind of that similar as things are happening or maybe right after the game is over, you go and you can check it and kind of see, you know, who is performing well in that game. They have their, you know, projected win meter that has mm -hmm. not been favorable to the Kraken <laughs> this year uh, that often, unfortunately. Um, and then as far as like Corsi Fenwick zone start times, I know my go-to forever, especially when looking at like a season and everything, not so much game to game has been just hockey reference. You, mm -hmm. you go to hockey reference, pick a team, go to their roster, pick a player, scroll down. You'll see all the like standard counting stats, all that stuff. But you scroll down a little further, you'll hit NHL position metrics. And then it's all right there. You've got Corsi four against in the percentage, Fenwick four against in the percentage. And then over on the right, you've got offensive zone starts, defensive zone starts. And then you can kind of look at all the numbers like that. And, you know, again, you can see over the course of their career, over the course of any given season, how a player's performing when it comes to that kind of stuff. And uh, it's it's just a lot of fun. Yeah, agreed 100%. It's it's great at kind of visualizing, especially over a longer run, uh, you know, whether it's players, teams, you can go to your favorite team and just sort by mm -hmm. a certain category, by zone starts, by Corsi 4, you know, you can see all those types of things. So 
yeah, would absolutely recommend Hockey Reference. Yeah. All right. I think that's going to do it for this segment, right, RJ? Yep. All right. And that's going to do it for this episode of The Deep Dive. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this one. Uh, excited to get Kraken Hockey back coming up this week. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Get to see how, you know, officially the second half of the season is going to go. I know we're technically already there, but really it doesn't start till the All-Star break for me. That's when everybody can do their resets. I guess they've already had a couple opportunities to do that this <laughs> year. But in my mind, right, they can, you know, seasons pass. That's where it comes in. Um, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun and, you know, it's just going to be exciting to be doing like post game lives and everything again, RJ, I, I miss yes, interacting I miss with it. everybody. I know I miss it so much. I've been going a little crazy here without, uh, the crack and hockey going on. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely looking forward to it starting up again. Yes, for sure. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us for this one and we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>